I really liked Omaha. It was a size where I knew a lot of the people who mattered and what they did. So I wasn't lost in a great metropolis. Mm. And I was very fortunate in my the nature of my parents, my parents' friends. And I was fortunate in the public schools I attended were pretty remarkable by the standards of the time. And of course, most of my schooling was in the Great Depression. But that means I'm one of the very few people that's still alive who deeply remembers the Great Depression. And that's been very helpful to me. It was so extreme that people like you have just no idea what the hell it was like. <laughs> it was really, there was just nobody had any money. The rich people didn't have any money. People would come and beg for a meal at the door and we had a hobo jungle not very far from my grandfather's house. And uh, I was forbidden to walk through it, which meant I walked through it all the time. <laughs> and I was safer in that hobo jungle in the depths of the 30s when people were starving practically than I am walking around my own neighborhood now in Los Angeles at night. <laughs> the world has changed on that. You'd think the crime would be less, but it was, the crime was pretty low in those days. So at any rate, I, so I had a very unusual bunch of experience to be to go through civilization in various phases, including the greatest recession. Well, I say it's one of the greatest recessions in 600 years in the English-speaking world. It was really something. And it was very interesting to watch and, uh, and also to watch it fixed. It was fixed by the accidental Keynesianism of World War II. Very interesting. And Hitler had fixed the Great Depression in, in Germany by the deliberate Keynesianism, but he wasn't doing it to stimulate the economy. He wanted to get even with all the people he hated, but he borrowed all this money and created all these armaments. And Hitler's Germany by 1939 was the strongest economic power in Europe, and nobody else was close. So, and you wouldn't understand that as well as I do if you hadn't lived through it. You just could see the place gaining traction more and more and more and more, and pretty soon it was fixed. And, and, and of course, that was, in those days there were all kinds of people, most of my family, for they believed in hard money based on gold and not much welfare and so on and so on. So that, I was raised among fairly backward people by modern standards. But they were backward in kind of a self-reliant way that I think was helpful. Uh, I've never regretted that I wasn't raised in a more liberal establishment. I had a liberal aunt. She was really my mother's cousin, but she, I was, and she was the first, second lady dean at the University of Chicago. And she'd done her thesis on the conditions in the coal mines. And of course she was a screaming leftist. I would be a screaming leftist if I observed the way the coal miners of yesteryear were treated. You couldn't be a human being with any decency in you without feeling that it was deeply improper to have the misery that great and have it manipulated for the benefit of the mine owners and so forth. But she sent me all these left wing bings books, one every Christmas, and I always thought she was a little nuts. <laughs> Which shows that if sometimes the very vivid extreme ex, you know, evidence misleads you on the deeper reality, you, you've got to be a guard on that, against that all your life. In fact, the whole trick in life is to get so that your own brain doesn't mislead you. And, and I have found that just a lifelong fun game. And I can't remember a time I wasn't doing it. I was not a prodigy or anything like that, but I was, I was a prodigy in having adult interests. I was interested in what worked and what didn't and why. And I could see that very eminent people that I loved and revered were nuts in some ways. And I would decide, well, I certainly like Dr. Davis, but he's a little nutty in one way and I'm not gonna be that, like that. And so I was very judgmental and 
I think that helped me. <laughs> and, and also helped me that I kept changing my judgments as I learned more and more facts came in. And that created lifelong habits that were very, very useful. Another thing that I think really helped me is particularly on my father's side of the family. My, my paternal grandfather was the only federal judge in Lincoln, Nebraska, the capital city of Nebraska. And he'd been there forever and he stayed there forever after that. I think when he left, he was the longest serving federal judge in the country. And he was a brilliant man and he'd risen from nothing. He was the child of two impoverished school teachers. And when he was raised in a little town in Nebraska, they'd give him a nickel to go buy the meat and he'd go to the butcher shop and he would buy the parts of the animal nobody else would eat. And that's what two school teachers lived on in those days. And the very indignity of it bothered him so much that he, he, he just determined to get out of poverty and, and never go back. And he did. He got ahead like Abe Lincoln, educated himself in lawyers' offices and so on. He had to leave college because he couldn't pay the tuition anymore. And, but he educated himself, and since he was utterly brilliant, it wasn't all that hard. And he had an attitude that was pretty damned extreme. And I would say his attitude was that you have a moral duty to make yourself as unignorant and as unstupid as you possibly can. And that it was your pretty much your highest moral duty. Maybe taking care of your family came first, but, but in the ranks of moral obligations, quasi-religious, well, yeah, he was conventionally religious, so it may have been a religious duty to him. But he, he really believed that, that rationality was a moral duty, and he worked at it, and he scorned people who'd, who, who didn't do it. On the other hand, as a judge, he started with the idea that why would anybody rob a train or whatever the hell you, federal crime in those days. And he was pretty hard on people who did it. And I noticed as he got to be older and older and older, he was willing to call a man a good man on easier terms than he started out with. And I think that was a correct, a correct development in my... By the way, when he relaxed a little, he was still pretty tough. <laughs> but he, he did relax a little, which I thought was appropriate. And, but it was a, but influenced by such people. And when the 30s came, one son-in-law was a musician. Of course, he couldn't make a living. So my grandfather didn't have that much money, sent him to pharmacy school, carefully picking a provision that couldn't fail, and found him a bankrupt pharmacy to buy and loaned him the money. And my uncle was soon prosperous and remained prosperous the rest of his life. My other uncle had a bank in Stromsburg, Nebraska, but there were 968 people in Stromsburg and there were two national banks. And the capitalization of my uncle's bank was $25,000. And of course, he was a lovely man, but he was an optimist and a banker should not be an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> and when they closed the banks in 1933, the banking examiners came in and they said, you can't reopen. And that was the only business he had. Well, Judge Munger had always saved his money and he had a lot of good first mortgages on homes occupied by teetotaling German butchers and people he'd carefully pitched. And of course, he never had a default. The houses were in the right neighborhood. The people were sober and hardworking. And, and so, what my grandfather did is take a third of his good mortgages, which is all he had, and put them into the bank and took all the lousy assets out of the bank. So he saved two out of three of his, of his children. And I thought it was a pretty good thing to do and very shrewd the way he did it. And he actually got most of his money back 10 or 15 years later out of the lousy assets of the bank when World War too. And that was a good lesson. On the other side, my grandfather on the other side, his main business had gone broke in 1922 with all the other wholesale dry goods houses. And what he did, 
his son-in-law, one of them went broke, and he cut his house in half and moved that family in. And the other family, the guy was an honors graduate of the Harvard School of Architecture, and he was very prosperous in the 20s in Omaha and had a wonderful life. And in the 30s came, the total building permits in Omaha would sometimes be $25,000 a month, and that was for furnace repairs or something. There was just no work, none, zero. So he moved to California, and he lived for several years, and he got, finally he got the County of Los Angeles to hire this great Harvard architect, and his, he got 10808 a month after deductions, and they had him do drafting work, but they classified him as a laundryman to save money. And he could actually rent a house for $25 and feed himself and drive an old car. But he could live on $109 a month. Amazing how poor everybody was. And what happened to that grandfather is along came the FHA and they had a competitive civil service examination. And he was a very brilliant man. Of course, he was first in the exam and that made him the chief architect for the FHA in Los Angeles where he spent the rest of his life. But I watched all of this family coping with all this difficulty. And I'll say this, it sounds awful, but they weren't all that unhappy. You can cope pretty well because you get used to it. That's the nice thing about the human condition. I mean, you get to be my age, you got a lot of horrible things to get used to. <laughs> it's just one new indignity all the time. <laughs> a friend of mine says, a good day when you're old is when you wake up in the morning and nothing new hurts. <laughs> So at any rate, that's my experience in Omaha. But that background, of these, all these people were educated and civilized and generous and decent. And a lot of them had good senses of humor. And it was a pretty damn good place to grow up in. And my memory is of being surrounded by a lot of very fine people. And I, I think the whole thing was privileged. I look at my background as absolutely privileged. I'm proud of being an Omaha boy. I sometimes use the old saying, they got the boy out of Omaha, but they never got Omaha out of the boy. And, and so that, all those old fashioned values, family comes first, be in a position so you can help others when troubles come, uh, prudent, sensible, moral duty to be reasonable more important than anything else, more important than being rich, more important than being important. An absolute moral duty, because none of my intelligent relatives suffered terribly because they didn't advance higher. Right, yeah, I mean, one of the things I'm fascinated by is, um, I mean, this was in the 20s and 30s, and the level of detail that you recall about their experiences and how that's shaping your experiences now. Well, I'm trying to give people a flavor of something that nobody else can remember. Yeah, you, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a student of the people that you're, that you're experiencing. So, so you grow up in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, you find yourself in Ann Arbor, Michigan. How does that happen? Very simple. I wanted to go to Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> and my father said to me, Charlie, I was the only son, two, two sisters. He says, I've got two daughters to educate right after you. I don't have unlimited money. He says, I will send you to Stanford if it really means a great deal to you. But I'd rather you pick a university in the Midwest much better than mine, which was the University of Nebraska. And that was obviously going to be Michigan. What was I going to say? Well, screw you, send me to Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say that. I went to Michigan. So, so, so you come to Michigan. I have never regretted that at all. I At Stanford, people came to Stanford in the 30s with their string of polo ponies. And it was a very upscale fraternity, sorority culture. I used to call it the coeducational Princeton of the West. And, and people loved it and so forth, but literally, You'd go to Stanford with a string of polo ponies? <laughs> I should say, I'm bringing back to you, young people, a time you can't remember. <laughs> Who did you ever know in college that came with a string of polo ponies? Not very many people. 
Now they go, they'd be in the ROTC, but they had their own string of polo points. <laughs> you could win better if you had your own string. <laughs> <laughs> so you come to Michigan and you study math for a year. Yes, but I don't get credit for that. When I was young, I could get an A in any mathematics course without doing any work at all. <laughs> and so I always took math because it meant that I could, literally, I never did any problem sets, I just did the math. And, and so I, I should not get credit as some budding mathematician. I was choosing what for me was the easiest way to think about what I wanted to do instead of what somebody else wanted me to do. Well, c come to find out, it ended up being a, a subject that has, I think, paid some dividends. Oh, um, hugely. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it, but, but, but this will interest you in this world where people have all these algorithms and computer science and fancy math and so forth. Neither Warren or I ever, have ever used any fancy math in business, and neither did Ben Graham, who taught Warren. Everything I've ever done in business could be done with the simplest algebra and and geometry and addition, multiplication, and so forth. I never used calculus for any practical work in my whole damn life. And I was a, <laughs> and I was a perfect whiz at it when they taught it to me. And by the way, since I never touched calculus, not one after I was 19 years old, I've lost it. It's the, the symbols would mystify me. And, but I think you'll find that if you really know the basic stuff, it's enormously useful, and only a very few people are ever gonna need any calculus. Hmm. So you study math at Michigan, then the yep. war comes calling. Yes. You move to California, and you study meteorology. Well, that was because I was too dumb to do what I should have done. <laughs> with, with my background, I should have gone to the Naval ROTC, because I hated infantry ROTC, which I'd done four years of in high school, rising to be second lieutenant, which is a very low rank. <laughs> and of course I was about five feet two I got my growth late and so I was I didn't I was not your ideal of a manly soldier in high school <laughs> and and so, so when you went to Harvard Law why Harvard why, why law so because well my grandfather and father had been lawyers and I knew I didn't want to do everything else it's very simple I didn't want to be a doctor I didn't want all the blood and misery and so forth <laughs> and the repetitive work I knew I didn't want to go to the bottom of a big organization and crawl my way up. I'm a natural contrarian. That was not going to work for me. And I found that people could tell me when I thought they were idiots. And that is not a way to rise in a big organization. <laughs> and, and so I couldn't do that. And so now I'm left with, with law. And I admired my father and grandfather and a good life for them. So I naturally drifted into it. I think people are still going to law school for that reason. It's the least bad of options considering their interests and ability. I guess now people go to business school, some of them who in my day would have gone to law school. <laughs> so you and yeah, many of the people in this room I think are gonna to go to business school is the least bad of their options. <laughs> <laughs> and all I can say is that that's the way it worked for me. And It'll probably it work out, out for you, too. And it worked out okay. It worked um, out okay. So, so well, I had to leave the profession. Well, well, it was you, a dumb profession for me to <laughs> so, so, so that's actually what I want to ask. So you move to California. You actually start a law firm and then practice law for some period of time. Well, I had no alternative. <laughs> and then you actually... I had an army of children almost immediately. <laughs> I painted myself in quite a corner. Yeah. <laughs> so zero choice is pretty powerful. Um, yes, for sure. Yes, of course. So, so, so you practice law and then you leave law in the firm that you helped found and yeah. move over to investments. Well, but help, help that, us that, understand that. That, that sounds miraculous. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it was rather interesting. I probably got paid about $350,000 in my first 13 years of law practice total. And, and I had an army of children and no capital to start with. And when I chose this alternative career, mm -hmm. I had over $300,000 in liquid instruments. So 
I had, and that was 10 years of living expenses. So I was not a courageous, venturesome, admirable man. I was a cautious little squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> saving up more nuts than I really needed and not going very deep into my pile of nuts. And so that was, it wasn't that courageous and I kept one foot in the law firm while I tried my capitalist career. But as soon as the capitalist career succeeded, I intended to lift that second foot because I recognized that the potential of law practice as I saw it then, I didn't anticipate the boom that came to the big firm. Uh, I just saw it as being more difficult. I wanted more independence than I was gonna have as a lawyer. I hated sending other people invoices and needing money from richer people. I thought it was undignified. I wanted my own money. <laughs> Not because I loved ease or social prestige, I wanted the independence. Well, and, and, and when you, so you founded Wheeler Munger and Company. So that yes. was the investment firm. Yes. And for and, about, and I went and I, I created five real estate projects. I did both side by side for a few years, and uh, in a very few years, I had three or four million dollars. And for a, a number of years, you outperformed the market two x, three x. And so, why did you then leave Wheeler Munger and Company, and then move to now what you're doing? Well, I had three or four million dollars, which was a lot of money then. And I also knew how to handle that three or four million dollars very well by that time. And so I, I knew I didn't need to get fees and override some other investors. Mm. And I found that when you got into things like the 70, 64, 74, 75 crunch, which was the worst since the 30s. I didn't suffer, I knew everything was gonna work out, but the quoted prices of these things really went down to ridiculous levels, and some of my investors I knew were suffering. You know, they needed the money. And of course, I have enough of a fiduciary gene that that pained me greatly. And so, I said, well, I, it's just, it's like the, my grandfather once they asked him how he felt when my aunt divorced my uncle, and he said, I feel just the way I did when they lanced my carbuncle. And that's the way I, I had a carbuncle. My fiduciary chain was giving me pain. And I said, so the hell with I lanced the carbuncle, and I just lived on my own money. No fees, no overrides, no salaries. It just, just seemed more manly to do, and I knew it would work. And so at what point did you meet Warren and... 1959. <laughs> and, and so where did Berkshire Hathaway come from in terms of this partnership that you all have now had for decades? Well, Warren had been taught by Ben Graham to buy things for less than they were worth no matter how lousy the business was. And you can't imagine a more lousy business than New England textile mills <laughs> because textile is a congealed electricity. And the electricity rates in New England were about 60% higher than TVA rates. Mm. So it was absolute, inevitable, certain liquidation. Now Warren should have known better than to buy into a totally doomed enterprise, but it was so damn cheap, he could buy it at a big discount from liquidating value. So he bought a big chunk and finally ended up in control of business. But the business was gonna die. So the only way to go forward from there was to wring enough money out of this declining textile, textile business to have more money than he paid to sure. get in and use it to buy something else. Well, that's a very indirect way to proceed. And I would not recommend it to any of you. Just because we did some dumb thing that worked, you don't have to repeat <laughs> our path. And, uh, and of course, we eventually learned to, not to buy these cigar butts when they were cheap and do these painful liquidations and, and, and to instead buy better businesses. That's the main secret of Berkshire. The reason that Berkshire has been successful as a big conglomerate, more successful than any other big conglomerate, so far as I know, any other big conglomerate in the world, 
The reason it's been successful is we try and buy things that aren't gonna require much managerial talent at headquarters. Everybody else thinks they've got a lot of managerial talent at headquarters. And that's a lot of hubris. If the business is lousy enough, it gets a wonderful manager. And the business has a lousy reputation and the manager has a good reputation. It's the business of the, it's the reputation of the business that's going to remain intact. You can't fix these really lousy businesses. You can wring the money out, whatever comes in liquidation, and do something else with it. But most lousy businesses can't be fixed. But at the time, Warren was, that's what he was doing. And so how, yes. how did you convince him? I helped him. He bought a windmill company <laughs> in a little town in Nebraska. And Warren didn't know anything about running a windmill company. He bought it because it was cheap. And he said, to him, what do you do? Why can't you fix my windmill company? Who can you get to help me? I said, I've got just the man for you. And so one of my old colleagues from a transformer business who was an accountant, I said, he will fix your windmill company. And the one was desperate, he, he didn't, he just hired him on the spot. And Harry walked in the first day in this little town, this big collection of windmills and so forth, and a whistle blew and the whole plant stopped for 15 minutes. And he said, what the hell is this? And he said, well, it's respect for the town. Not everybody has a funeral. He's, blow this whistle and stop for 15 minutes. And Harry said, that'll be the last time. And he, he just approached everything that way. And of course, another thing he did is he, he cut away all the fat that he didn't need. And then he found there were certain parts where we were the sole supply. And he raised all the price of those parts. You can see what a business genius we are. <laughs> So how, how did you convince Warren to stop buying the bad apples and start buying the good apples? I think Warren, Warren, he gave me credit for that. He was going to learn it anyway. He just made so much money in this other stuff, and he'd been taught it by Ben Graham. Sure. It was hard for him to quit when he was just coining money. But he saw the point. And well, you couldn't scale that business. And... and and it was kind of scroungy and unpleasant, and you're firing people. It's, who in the hell wants to do that? So, so we just wrung the money out and bought better businesses. And we've been doing it ever since. Coming to business, not as business school graduates, but as people who had owned portfolios of securities, mm -hmm. we thought like capitalists because we were always in the shelter mindset. And a lot of people running the businesses think like careerists. And believe me, you've got to think like a career is to some extent if you're in a career. But it also helps to look at the business strategy problems as though you're an owner. And so my advice to you is you, you don't want to be never get to be a career so much you don't see it from the owner's point of view. That's what General Motors did. They had a bunch of careerists. And an owner would have seen immediately that the, the situation was hopeless. And they just romped through it with a lot of denial and stupidity and pomposity. And, and of course, they went bankrupt. The mightiest company in the world went bankrupt. And, and none of those hotshot executives thought like an owner. They would have seen that it was hopeless. So, so Charlie, one of the things I've always been fascinated about. At least it was hopeless the way they were handling it. <laughs> well, with, with Berkshire and the way that you all manage both headquarters and the businesses that you own, you are putting talent in place who think like shareholders, not careerists. So how do you, when you're buying a business, how do you, or, or bringing talent into an existing business, how do you evaluate talent to see, are they going to think more like a shareholder as opposed Private to Private equity frequently buy a business where the founder is going to leave, then they go out and hire talent to run it. That is a tough way to make a buck. And I don't like it. We generally buy with the talent in place. Mm -hmm. Now maybe some guy in the number two place and we put him in the number one place. But we very seldom, I, can, I can't think of any place where we bought something and put somebody in after Harry Bottle. Mm -hmm. And no, we don't do that. And, and it's amazing how long we have some of those people stay. Warren always says we can't 
we can't teach the new dogs the old tricks. Hmm. Well, and what's, what's, <laughs> what's the implication of not being able to teach the old dogs new tricks or new tricks to old dogs um, when if we look at what's happening in business today um, what we see is executives... We can't teach the old tricks to the young dogs that's that's what we found and, and so we keep the old dog in place <laughs> But that's not, that's not the norm, right? I mean, if we look around... No, it's the norm in life. It may not be, our practices may not be the norm, but normally it's very hard to get the... You got a wise old dog, getting a young dog that can match him, that's hard. By definition, he's survived a big culling process. Sure. I mean, he's, he's, he's unique, and he's got a record to prove it. And by the way, everybody thinks... You can judge people by an interview. And of course, you know who you like and who you don't like. But everybody overestimates how much you can tell in prediction yeah. by meeting somebody. We all like to think that we have that capacity. But it's a vastly stupid type of overconfidence. The paper record has about three times the predictive value of your impression in an interview. And of course, we're buying great paper records. It's so simple. Well, it's, it, it's fascinating to me if we look around business generally, um, the movement of people across firms and uh, there's always new dogs. And you've taken a contrarian position to that and managed Berkshire differently. Well, it isn't like we're, we're, of course, we're still hiring young dogs in, into these businesses. But it's amazing how much of the record of Berkshire has come from the old dogs who are in the business when we buy them. You can't believe how good those people have been. There's one huge exception in the new dog department. I almost despise the business of executive search because I find that they really want to sell you the best that's available even if it's no damn good. And, <laughs> and I don't like that. But the best single expense that Berkshire ever had is we paid an executive recruiting firm to find a Saji chain to come into our little tiny insurance operation. He didn't have any experience in insurance at all. He was an honors graduate of the Maine Technical Institute of India. He was a very smart man. But he, he came in and created our whole re It's the only big business we created from scratch. And Ajit did the whole damn thing. Of course, he talked with Warren every night. And so it was like father and son. Remember, this is a very Confucian company. And, and uh, but that was unbelievable. So we, we hired an executive recruiter. He brings us an Indian that had no experience at all in insurance. He talks with an old man every night. And it's now by far the biggest reinsurance business in the world. And it's been a gold mine. There's at least $60 billion in Berkshire of net worth that Ajit has created that we would not have created without him. Wow. wow. And the value is way more than 60 billion. I mean, there's, I mean, there's that much an extra just liquid net worth, but the value of the business is way more than 60 billion. Wow. So Charlie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to a few questions from the audience uh, as, we, uh, as we start to, uh, to wrap up. Um, probably half my questions here are about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Well, I can answer those very quickly. <laughs> I think it's perfectly asinine to even pause to think about them. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to, to think that gold has some marvelous store of value because man has no way of inventing more gold or getting it very easily. So it has the advantage of rarity. Believe me. Man is capable of somehow creating more Bitcoin. You, you, they tell you they're not gonna do it. But they mean they're not gonna do it unless they want to. That, that's what they mean when they say they're not gonna do it. Yeah. If they tell you there are rules and they can't do it, don't believe them. When there's enough incentive, bad things will happen. It's bad people, crazy bubble, 
bad idea luring people into the concept of easy wealth without much insider work. That's the last thing on earth you should think about. If it worked, it would be bad for you because you try and do it again. <laughs> it's totally insane. And by the way, I've just laid out a wonderful life lesson for you. Give a whole lot of things a wide berth. They don't exist. You know, crooks, crazies, egomaniacs, people full of resentment, people full of self-pity, people who feel like victims. There's a whole lot of things that aren't going to work for you. Figure out what they are and then avoid them like the plague. And one of them is Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst thing would happen if you won because then you do it again. It's, just, it's total insanity. And it's so easy to simplify life from just all these things are beneath you. Yep. I don't even want to know. People are promoting Bitcoin. I don't want them to know, know my address. <laughs> so Charlie, They're I, not I, my I, kind of people. Char Charlie, what I hear you saying is you're not going to be investing in Bitcoin. <laughs> is that that's fair? I think you're fair. So, 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 so let, let me move to a, a, a similarly uh, maybe controversial topic. Uh, I, don't, I, you know, I don't know if you read the news recently, but there's a lot of tax policy conversation uh, going on, both here in California and, and nationally as well. Um, what, what you, what's your thought on where this ends up? Uh, in terms of the well, tax policy. I, I think we will get a tax bill. I think they will squeak it through and they'll make whatever adjustments they have to do to get the last few votes. Uh, I don't think it's a bit crazy to give this extra 2000 a year to all those people who make $70,000 a year and have a lot of children. That strikes me as a it's good politics and probably good policy. I also do not think it is crazy to reduce the corporate income tax on the C corporation. And if you look at the world, a lot of the places that have worked best, including Singapore and so forth, have that policy and may even have good macroeconomic consequences. And a lot of the people who are screaming about it and are so sure it won't work they may not be right, it may actually work pretty well. It causes the capital values of the companies to come up and there's a wealth effect from the increased market value of all the companies. Everybody recognizes there's an effect, but people, some people say it's small and some people say it's gonna be large. And I'll tell you what they all have in common, none of them know. It is not totally inconceivable that it will work pretty well. And with so much of the world doing well with similar tax policy, and of course, the Democrats go berserk on this subject. And, but I think, I think they're wrong. It may actually help them. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure it'll work. It may not, but it's not totally crazy. Well, it, it, it reminds me of a piece of advice that, uh, that you've, uh, you've offered and, and, and given to me, um, which is, you know, people often have a point of view, and the danger in, uh, in having that point of view is you start to assume with certainty that you're right. Absolutely. Totally crazy. And, and, and I, I think what your point of view is, is you need to have a point of I view. Just a minute. Here's a very important subject I've been thinking about all my life. You ask for my opinion. Yeah. I don't really know how well it's going to work. I don't think anybody else does either. I think it'll work to some extent, but how much I don't know. Now, is it unfair? Well, the corporations are by and large owned by a bunch of charitable endowments and by a bunch of pension plans. And the whole world is going into a world where they're trying to have the business interests of the company support their huge pension obligations that get bigger all the time. 
China is trying to do exactly what the Republicans are. China wants to have the main businesses in China own more by the pension plans and the stocks to do well. I don't think China's crazy to have that. I don't think the Republicans are crazy either. It could work pretty well. And, and, and it's not just some evil thing that people are cooking up. It's a disagreement between people. And both sides who have violent hatreds and contempt for the other side, they're wrong. It's a disagreement on policy that ought to be civilized. When I see Congress on my television set and the degree of hatred they have, utter contempt. I mean, really serious, way more than is usual. Mm -hmm. it's, it's evil to hate that much. It's a mistake to hate that much. That much hatred will turn, it's always been true. As anger comes in, reason leaves. It's a truism. So do you want to adopt a political point of view where you're angry all the time? If you do, welcome to the house of misery and pretty low worldly achievement to boot. So if that's what you want, I, I, you just if I found out how to do it, behave like those people you see on television. Well, the other thing that's In both parties, by the way. Yeah. The other thing that's true, going back to one of your earlier comments, is the difference, difference between a careerist mindset and a service or shareholder mindset, where in politics we have the emergence of a careerist mindset that is shaping how people behave because they're trying to survive. Not only that, they have a group think. Just as the Moonies go crazy because they hang around together, so do our politicians. Yeah, and right. do you want to go crazy? Is that what your ambition in life? You start with some advantage. Just make yourself a violently believing politician on either side. You'll turn your brain into cabbage. <laughs> You only got one brain. Why would you want to turn it into cabbage? <laughs> <laughs> so, Charlie, I've got a, a question here. What's the uh, new amazing technology that you're most excited about? Well, I tend to get not, not to get very excited about. I think that technology changes the world, and, it, and that reminds me of a thing. If I ask you what was the biggest, the worst single mistake in the work of Adam Smith, you know, I know I'd get a, I don't see everybody big eyes lighting up. <laughs> the biggest mistake in the work of Adam Smith, he was totally right about markets and so on and the advantages of trade, division of labor and so forth. What he missed was how much the steady advance of technology would advance wealth and standards of living. He, in the 1700s, was living not too much differently from the way they lived in the Roman Empire, and he just missed it. But, and there in fact had been huge improvements in technology, but he just missed it. He wasn't very technically minded, and it was really stupid. And now I'll ask you a harder question. What was the worst mistake David Ricardo made? I'll bet the dean can't answer this question. I'm not gonna ask you to try. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you the answer. I'll tell you the answer. David Ricardo missed, he got the first order consequences of trade perfectly right. And it was not an obvious insight, and it was a great achievement, which is, but he didn't think about the second order consequences. He wasn't mathematical enough to see, and he wasn't mathematical to think what would happen when one country had way higher living standards than another. And he, 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 like Adam Smith, he missed. And the main issue in a place like the United States is if, if you have an advanced nation and some other nation, which is numerous, but the people, if anything, are better on average than yours in terms of their innate quality, which I think is roughly true of China. And, and and they're in poverty, they're living in caves, and they're caught in a Malthusian trap, and you got an advanced economy, and you suddenly go into free trade. What is going to happen is, Ricardo proved it, both sides are gonna live better, right? But the 
the people here that are assimilating all the great economies of the world in China, they're going to go up way faster. So you go up 2% a year and they go up 12. And pretty soon they're the dominant nation in the world and you aren't. Well, are you really better off? Well, the answer is no. And Ricardo never figured out any of that stuff. So I'm telling you that so that you can fix your inadequate knowledge of Ricardo. And, <laughs> and, but one of the interesting problems of that is you can't understand Ricardo properly in thinking about the United States vis-a-vis -vis free trade with China without thinking about the tragedy of the commons. Because if we had the only nation in the world except for China, we could say we won't trade with them, we'll just leave them in their damned agricultural poverty and we'll just, you know, and we could probably have done that. But the whole rest of the world will trade, but they're going to rise anyway. So we don't have any power to, to, to hold back the, the rise of China by not trading with them. So we had to do what we did. And once you do that, now they're going to be a greater power than we are. And the two of us are going to be big enough so we can accomplish pretty nearly anything we both want to do. So we have to be friendly with China. So you can imagine how I like Donald Trump complaining about the Ch Chinese. It's really stupid. <laughs> it's a compulsory friendship. It's a compulsory friendship. You, you'd be out of your mind to do anything else. Why wouldn't you want to have an intimate, friendly relationship with the biggest other power in the whole damn world? Yeah. Particularly when they got a bunch of atom bombs. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just nutty. We have no alternative but to do this. And when that happens, you're going to get a certain amount of misery at the people who are competing with the Chinese as they rise from poverty with trade and so forth. That was inevitable. It's not the fault of a bunch of ev evil Republicans who don't love the poor. That is just total balderdash. It just happened. And we didn't have all these choices. So, so Charlie, in, ra in wrapping up, um, we've got, I don't know, roughly 250, 300 people in the room tonight. Um, and many of them looking um, at their futures, uh, their careers, uh, with many decades ahead of them. Um, oh, I look, wish I had many decades ahead. <laughs> I'd, trade, I'd trade some large numbers if I could just buy some life expectancy. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, as you look back on your life experience, what's the, what's the most important piece of advice that you would offer everyone in the room tonight as they look forward in, 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 into their futures? Well, there are a few obvious ones. They're all ancient. Ben Franklin, here, marriage is like the most important decision you have, not your business career. It'll do more for you, good or bad, than <laughs> anything else. And the, Ben Franklin had the best advice ever given on marriage. He said, Keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut thereafter. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how if you just get up every morning and keep plugging and have some discipline and keep learning and, and it's amazing how it works out okay. And I don't think I don't think it's wise to have an ambition to be president of the United States or a billionaire or something like that because the odds are too much against you. Much better to aim low. I did not intend to get rich. I wanted to get independent. I just overshot. And <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, while you're clapping, some of the overshooting was accidental. There's some, there's a, there's a big, you can be very deserving and very intelligent and very disciplined, but there's also a factor of luck that comes into this thing. And the people who get the good, the outcomes that seem extraordinary, they're the people who have discipline and intelligence and good virtue, plus a hell of a lot of luck. Why wouldn't the world work like that? So you shouldn't give credit for the unusual. Uh, a lot of the people, a friend of mine said about a colleague of his in his fraternity, 
He says, old George was a duck sitting on a pond and they raised the level of a pond. There are a lot of people that just luck into the right place and rise and then, and there are a lot of very eminent people who have many advantages and they've got one little flaw or one bit of bad luck and they, they're mired in misery all their lives. But that makes it interesting to have all this variation.